All right, everyone, I am here with Meredith Broussard. Meredith is an associate professor at NYU and research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. Meredith, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I'm super excited to have you on the show. We last spoke, it was almost exactly a year ago in the context of the release and our screening of the Coded Bias documentary, which you were a part of and you participated in a panel uh, with our community, which was a great discussion and uh, excited to be speaking once again. Uh, to get us started, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, so it is great to be back. Um, so I am a data journalism professor at NYU. I started my career as a computer scientist. I quit to become a journalist. Uh, and one of the things that I do is I develop AI systems for investigative reporting. Uh, however, I, when I started doing that, I would you know, go to meet people at parties and I would say, this is what I do. And they would kind of look at me blankly and say, you know, you mean like you make robot reporters? And I would say, no, that sounds awesome, but that's not what I do. <laughs> and so I realized that there was a need to uh, talk more broadly about what AI is and isn't, uh, which kind of led me into the global conversation about AI ethics uh, and my own interests in social justice, in public interest technology uh, have kind of informed uh, informed my work. Uh, in that sphere. So I talk about technology, I make technology, uh, and I am excited to talk with you today about uh, the intersection of technology and society. So the alliance that you direct at NYU uh, that's focused on public interest technology, um, I guess prompts a question for me. When you say public interest technology, what exactly does that mean? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, so the Alliance was founded by my colleague, Charlton McElwain, who is the author of the book Black Software, uh, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it yet. Uh, and public interest technology refers to exactly what it sounds like, doing technology that is in the public interest. So there are kind of two ways you can do it. Sometimes public interest tech means making better government technology. Uh, it kind of got started as a field after the healthcare.gov debacle, uh, after healthcare.gov launched and nobody could buy healthcare through it. Uh, people working in the government realized, oh, wait, we really need to modernize things. We need to uh, upskill government workers so that we can do things like develop websites and, uh, and have effective government technology. Uh, so some people who are working in public interest tech are building better uh, government technology. They're doing things like uh, renovating the unemployment insurance system and uh, making sure that healthcare.gov keeps working. Because interestingly, you haven't heard anything about healthcare.gov since uh, its initial, uh, initial struggles. And that's really good. That's exactly what you want in government software, right? Like you, you want it to work. You don't want to think about it too much. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the other way you can do public interest technology uh, is the way that journalists do it, um, which is that you can use technology in order to hold decision makers or algorithms accountable. So traditionally, one of the functions of the media is to hold uh, people in power accountable. Uh, and so one of the things we do as algorithmic accountability reporters is we interrogate algorithms. Um, you can see a lot of really interesting algorithmic accountability work happening at The Markup. Uh, the Markup just published an investigation uh, today, the day we're recording, um, that analyzes a huge trove of data that they found just unsecured, sitting there totally unprotected on the internet uh, from a predictive policing software program called PredPol. Uh, so this has given millions of uh, recommendations about uh, what it thinks potential crime areas are. And the markup in Gizmodo found this data, 
analyzed it, and they discovered that the most widely used predictive policing software is systematically targeting and harassing black and brown people, poor people. Uh, so the software is magnifying existing inequalities in the world. And we wouldn't know this unless we had reporters who are creating technology that is in the public interest, that is monitoring, uh, you know, kind of monitoring uh, the software that's used by, uh, by institutions. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, one of the one of the things that you are up to uh, this time of year is an invited talk at NeurIPS that you're doing uh, that intersects with a, a book that you recently completed, not yet published, but completed. Uh, I'd love to dig into those two. They're related. Um, the provisional title of the book is more than a glitch what everyone needs to know about making technology anti-racist accessible and otherwise useful to all um you know one maybe starting point for the 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 conversation is the book kind of speaks broadly about technology your talk is at NeurIPS, you know, an AI conference, you know, what do you see as the relationship between, you know, technology and, and AI? Are you, are the issues in one kind of common to the other? You know, something I realized uh, recently was that I, I no longer make a distinction between regular technology and AI, right? So when AI was new, uh, it felt really special. And it felt like, oh, this is exciting and different. But actually, in the past couple of years, AI has become increasingly mundane. Uh, there is AI in absolutely everything now. Uh, you know, you're activating something like 250 different AI models when you do a single Google search. Uh, you know, we are uh, we are talking over a video link, uh, the automated transcription software that we're going to use to uh, generate uh, a transcript is a kind of AI. So AI is still marketed as something that's uh, kind of woo woo and exciting. But in in practice, it doesn't really feel like that anymore. So I. I've kind of moved to looking at uh, the whole of technology as uh, as kind of integrated. Uh, and it reminds me of uh, back in the day when we thought that things on the internet were different than things in real life, right? So we had online culture and we had IRL culture. Everything was called I or E. Yeah, remember when those things were different? <laughs> And now they're not. Right. So AI used to be something different and special, and kind of now it's not. Like now it's just seamlessly integrated. Uh, so one of the things that I do in the book is I just I talk about AI, I talk about uh, you know other kinds of technology, and it's kind of all it's all of a piece. Uh, it's all about uh, technology and society, and what are the intersections and collisions there. Yeah, one of the interesting questions that that raises for me is, you know, we think in, in the AI community a lot and talk a lot about, you know, AI ethics, responsible AI, and a lot of those conversations are grounded in understanding and in, in an understanding of the way machine learning models are created and biases and and all of that and, um you know, blurring the distinction between AI and technology, you know, suggests that uh, maybe the, the way to think about these issues isn't from a, you know, technology up perspective, but a, you know, problem down or back perspective. Is that part of what you're encouraging us to do? Uh, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, my, uh, my perspective on how do we solve problems of AI ethics uh, is not about starting with the technology. It's about starting with the human problem and looking at what do we already have in place 
Uh, so for example, let's take insurance, uh, which, okay, I realize that maybe this is a boring example for some people, but I promise, <laughs> uh, I promise it's not actually going to be a boring example. Uh, so let's take the example of insurance. So there was a big, uh, a big scandal a few years ago when uh, it was discovered that Optum was using uh, models that discriminated uh, against a particular group of people. Um, and it was found that the models were biased. Okay, well, so how do you uh, how do you prove that? How do you prosecute that? How do you remedy that so that it doesn't happen again? Uh, and also, how do you figure out whether it's happening at other insurance companies? You know, are other insurance companies also using models to try and figure out who, uh, you know, who should uh, be allowed to access certain kinds of healthcare? Um, I believe in this case, the uh, the models were predicting. That uh, that black people were going to be more expensive patients, or that black people shouldn't have uh, particular kinds of treatments. We know that the models are making making decisions that don't make sense to human beings, and we also know that ML models, machine learning models, will discriminate by default. They will take all of the existing systematic inequality in the world and they will reproduce it and they will generally not make the right decisions. So we can look at it from a social perspective. We can say, okay, what kinds of laws do we have in place that uh, prevent discrimination? What kinds of regulatory bodies do we have in place to regulate companies? And in the case of insurance, we have state insurance regulatory boards, right? So what do we need? Well, we need uh, the people who work at state insurance regulatory boards to have enough uh, technical savvy to understand that this is happening. We need them to have tools in order to identify bias, uh, and we need the legal system to be able to intervene and say, okay, this model is being discriminatory. Uh, you know, here is the, uh, here is the carrot, you know, we're going to, you know, uh, we're going to uh, start implementing sanctions or whatever. And then we've got the, uh, the, the stick of, okay, you're still violating the law. Uh, you know, company, you are in legal trouble now. So it's a it's a systems wide approach, and it's not necessarily about building an AI to monitor the AI. It's not necessarily about, uh, you know, defining human things in propositional logic and then building system against it. We can kind of look at what exists already, and build on that instead of trying to invent reinvent the wheel. Part of the the kind of learning in that story is that we've got existing frameworks, uh, you know, frameworks around uh, laws, frameworks around auditing and governance that we can rely on to address some of these issues. What's still missing for me is what should Optum have done differently so that they didn't get into the situation that they found themselves in. Does your framework provide some guidance there? Oh, so that's a really good question. And so now we're back to public interest technology. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that I uh, that I talk about in my uh, in my NeurIP speech is a chapter from the upcoming book uh, that is about public interest technology and about auditing and about how can we build. Uh, software systems that uh, do not include algorithmic bias. Uh, and so my current thinking on this uh, is that uh, we can use all of the really amazing work that's been done recently on mathematical dimensions of fairness, and we can integrate this into our software systems and we can build monitoring systems, continuous monitoring systems to make sure that algorithmic bias is not sneaking its way in. Uh, so I'm actually working with uh, Kathy O'Neill and her company Orca O'Neill Risk uh, and algorithmic auditing, risk consulting and algorithmic auditing 
associates. Uh, and we are building a platform uh, for monitoring algorithmic systems uh, for algorithmic bias. Awesome. And I, I, what I love about that is that it's, it's kind of, it parallels what's already happening from a technology perspective to do continuous monitoring of machine learning models. It's just asking slightly different questions instead of focusing on, you know, accuracy and data drift and other things. This is more focused on uh, monitoring for bias, responsibility, and, and other topics. And so for many organizations that are currently going through the process of building out this monitoring infrastructure anyway, they will be down the path and, and can maybe just plug in some of the um, or extend what they're already doing to you know help them uh, address and prevent the these kinds of challenges. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and looking for algorithmic bias, auditing for algorithmic bias should be part of the workflow. Um, there is a uh, there's a diagram uh, that I use in the book uh, that comes from Salesforce, and it's about the software development cycle and kind of where does uh, you know where should you be thinking about algorithmic bias? Uh, and the quick answer is you should be thinking about it at every point in the software development cycle. Uh, and if you are monitoring and you find bias or you find a problem, you discover that uh, you know there are a dozen user reports that say, well, uh, you know, we've been having this particular kind of problem, and you realize that oh, the software is discriminating against people of color, or it's not working for people who have a particular uh, phenot physical phenotype, then you you roll it back. Uh, you roll back the software, you address the problem immediately, uh, and uh, this is just your, this is a different way of doing business, but this is how we should be approaching things. We should be acknowledging that algorithms can cause harms, uh, that this is an ethical issue, that this is a marketplace issue, and this is something that companies need to keep on top of. Same way that they keep on top of other compliance issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another topic from the book and also uh, your NeurIPS talk is on the intersection of gender uh, and technology. Yeah, How does gender come into play? Sure. So what, what I do in my NeurIPS talk is uh, I... I I kind of read two uh, two sections of the book. Uh, one is about uh, public interest technology and algorithmic auditing, uh, and why I think that's exciting. And the other is about uh, how the new frontier for gender rights is inside databases. Uh, so it it started a few years ago. Um, when I uh, started actively trying to be a better ally to the trans community. Uh, and uh, it also had to do with a problem that I was having, uh, which is that I was running late and I needed to take the train downtown to work and I, I didn't have any cash. Uh, so the I was living in Philadelphia and at this point on the train, uh, they didn't have... Uh, ticket machines at every station. So if you didn't have a ticket, you needed to buy a ticket from the conductor using cash on the train. But I didn't have any cash and I was late and there was no ticket machine. And my husband had a monthly transit pass. And I said, oh, can I use your monthly transit pass? And he said, well, I would give it to you, but it has a big M sticker on it for mail. And I don't think that the conductor would let you use it. And I said, well, why does it have a gender sticker? That's, right. you know, that's ridiculous. Why can't I use your trans pass? And he said, I, I don't know. Like, that's just the way it is. Uh, and I didn't know about this because I had never bought a monthly transit pass before in Philadelphia. Uh, so I started thinking about, OK, well, is this a problem for other people like me? And then 
I that that question, is this a problem for other people the way it is for me, is a question that reporters ask ourselves a lot. And it's where a lot of trend stories get started. But then I started asking myself a different question that maybe we should ask more often, which is, is this a problem for people who are not like me? Mm -hmm. Right. Who else uh, might be affected by this? Uh, And I realized that uh, if you are a member of the trans community, you're probably, uh, you know, you're probably experiencing all kinds of microaggressions uh, and, you know, kind of horrific situations from people selling the transit pass because the the process of the transit pass was you have to go up to the you know to the little window and you have to buy your pass and they kind of eyeball you and then put on a sticker and that did not seem like it was uh an interaction that was uh that was guaranteed to go well uh in 2013 when i was writing about this um i had a so, really i had an interesting experience very much along these lines just recently i was i think i was signing up for some airline frequent flyer program or something and i must have fat fingered a form or a checkbox or something like that and i got this error message when i tried to submit it that said that the gender that i had clicked didn't match with the title that i had clicked like Mr. or doctor or whatever that was didn't match with, you know, the male female option. Uh, And I forget which one I did incorrectly, but I thought that's an elaborate rule. (laughs) Right. And one that, uh, you know, that is totally unnecessary. (laughs) Yeah. Let alone that they were, you know, they were both required fields, right? Like, you know, I don't know. So that's incredibly out of date. Yeah. And so it turns out that there are a lot of computer systems and a lot of human systems that are set up like this. Uh, And it comes from the fact that computer systems, uh, especially large scale ones, large scale institutional systems, are designed with 1950s ideas about gender. Uh, And inside the systems, gender is often stored as a binary. So you know about the gender binary. It's the idea that there are only two genders, you know, male and female. Our understanding socially of gender has now expanded. We understand that there are more than two genders, that gender is a spectrum, uh, and uh, people have different gender identities. Uh, gender should be an editable field, for one thing. Uh, but a lot of these systems are built so that you can't edit the gender field, so there are only two options. And even further behind the scenes, uh, you have to think about how is that data stored? Okay, so it can be stored as a string, which is a word. It could be stored as a number, okay, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, or it can be stored as a binary, as a 0 or a 1. So when computer systems were made in the six, in 60s, 70s, and like through the 90s, really, like until storage got really cheap, uh, programmers were extremely uh, conservative about how much space they used in programs. So if you had a data field, you wanted to use as small a space as possible because storage space was really expensive. Memory was expensive. So storing something as a binary, storing a data field as a binary, was a more efficient way of programming. And this ended up being the habit. And so today, people still will store gender as a binary field, which prevents it from being editable, prevents you from writing in a gender. So addressing this small piece of computational systems is actually really important for uh, for gender equality, uh, for you know, for progress. And do there have you seen downstream implications uh, when it comes to using this data and uh, machine learning, AI, those kinds of applications? You know, I'm not too worried about that. Uh, I feel like the computers should uh, fall in line with what is happening in society 
I don't think that people should bend over backwards to, you know, to make things easier for computers. Another topic that you cover in the book is around uh, education uh, and stuff that you've seen with uh, in, in the educational domain. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, something I wrote for the New York Times uh, a year or two ago was a story about when real students are assigned imaginary grades. Uh, so during the what pandemic, what does that even mean? <laughs> I know it's it's shocking, isn't it? Uh, I've always been fascinated by uh, by issues of technology and education. I mean, I'm a professor. I use a lot of technology. I teach students how to make technology and also how to critique technology. Uh, and I found out that uh, sometimes people are using algorithmic systems to predict student grades, uh, which is really ridiculous because why are you like, why aren't you allowing the student to succeed or fail on their own? Like, that's the point of education is, is kind of seeing, is letting somebody have their own journey through the educational system. And there's this very American idea that you can succeed through education, that you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps, that we have public education that is available to everybody. And if you want to avail yourself of it, like it's there. And so these predictive systems are really terrible because all they do is predict that poor kids will fail and rich kids will succeed. And what are examples of these systems and where they're used? Oh, so what happened during the pandemic is that the International Baccalaureate Organization, which is an international degree granting, high school degree granting organization, uh, canceled their usual exams. So IB exams uh, happen in the spring and they are a little bit like AP exams. Uh, it's a content based exam in a different in different subjects. And if you get a high enough grade on your IB subject exam, uh, you can get an IB diploma, which is in addition to your regular high school diploma and is very prestigious. And you can also get college credit for high enough IB scores. So for low income students, uh, what they can do is they can take a bunch of IB exams and get, you know, if they get good scores, then they can get college credit and graduate in fewer years. Right. So it's a really uh, it's a really crucial piece of maintaining affordability for low income students. And in fact, uh, most of the uh, of the students who are enrolled in IB in the U.S. do come from low income backgrounds. Uh, so the IB obviously couldn't have their exams in person during the height of the pandemic. Uh, and so they decided to cancel the in-person exams and use uh, an algorithmic system to predict the grades that the students would have gotten had they taken the test, which they didn't do because there was a pandemic. And wow. I mean, just so they assigned imaginary grades to real students uh, and the imaginary grades said, OK, well, we're going to predict that the poor kids and the black and brown kids are going to get bad grades. And we're going to predict that the white kids, the rich kids are going to get good grades. And of course, this was a disaster and there were mass thousands and thousands of people who protested and it was just a really poor decision. So it sounds ridiculous in retrospect, but at the time the bureaucrats were like, oh, well, let's, uh, you know, we, we have all this data, let's just plug it into an algorithm system and let it make a prediction because, you know, it was this, this techno chauvinist idea that the computer is just going to step in and solve all of our problems. And the computer doesn't really solve all of our problems. The computer is great, but the computer is not magic. Uh, and it's just going to replicate uh, the worst of humanity. Mm. If left to its own devices. Exactly. Exactly. So we can't just, we can't just build computer systems and set it and forget it and expect those computer systems to make good decisions in the social realm. You know, because computers are machines for doing math. Like they literally compute. And, you know, mathematical fairness is not the same as social justice. Uh, 
you know, we we are past the era where we could just build computer systems to uh, to solve the easy problems. We've solved all the easy problems with computers, right? Like we are left with the hard problems and we're not, we're not, uh, well, we have a ways to go. Got it. And, and so what were some of your key takeaways uh, for the NeurIPS talk? Uh, what I would love for people to take away from the NeurIPS talk is an increased understanding and awareness of uh computer systems as uh, as socio-technical systems. Uh, I would love for people to uh, think harder about the way that we build systems and the way that computer systems might be interfering or uh, or preventing social progress. Uh, and so I would love if, you know, somebody hears the uh, hears the talk and they are building a computer system and they say, oh, well, hey, we need to make, uh, you know, make the gender field editable. Uh, we need to go back and, uh, you know, look at our large scale uh, systems inside this bank and make sure that when uh, when somebody transitions, we have an easy way for them to. Uh, to update their name, to update their gender. Uh, you know, I would love it if somebody would listen to the talk and uh, adapt uh, Google Photos so it doesn't uh, sneak attack uh, trans folks with, uh, you know, with pictures of their pre-transition selves, uh, which can be, uh, you know, which can be really triggering and alienating. Uh, I would love if somebody would listen to the talk and say, oh, hey, I really want to get interested, get involved in public interest technology. Uh, and they go to uh, the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology website uh, and find out more information. Or they go to the uh, Public Interest Technology University Network website and find out more information and get involved locally. Awesome. All great next steps. Meredith, it's been wonderful catching up. Thanks so much for sharing a bit about what you're up to. Sam, thanks so much for having me. Take care.